Hello, welcome. Markus Völter here, Omega Tau Podcast. I want to give you a brief uh, overview over the SOFIA flights on October 20 and 21, um, in which I participated. These were science flights 248 and 249. Um, the photos were taken by a couple of people listed on the right. These were all members of a group of teachers who flew on SOFIA as part of the SOFIA German Ambassador Program. The SOFIA Telescope has a quite serious education and public outreach program as part of which they regularly fly educators. And I uh, also flew on these two flights together with the teachers. I was the media guy and I did that because I was recording a podcast, actually two podcast episodes for my Omega Tau podcast. So if you're interested in not listening to me, but actually listening to the experts, you can go to the omegataupodcast.net slash Sophia URL and uh, download two podcasts in total, 10 hours, uh, interviews with scientists, engineers and aircrew, and uh, obviously also recorded um, ambience and radios and intercom and stuff like that. So check out the website, get the audio. Um, this presentation is intended as a kind of overview or teaser and also uh, as the you know as a way of actually showing a couple of pictures because the podcasts are audio only so here is the group of people whom i was with while in the us for sofia i'm the guy with the gray uh, sweater in the middle and uh, the other five well four of them are teachers on the very right is antje lischke weiss who was uh, herding us uh, while we were in the us Teachers from left to right are Martin Metzendorf, Ilka Lehnbach, Schmitz Lehnbach, um, Robert Heidenreich, and Oliver Baum. Sorry, I was a bit distracted. All right, so where were we? So we, this is a map of the west coast of the US. You can see Los Angeles, and if you zoom in a little bit, you can see at the kind of middle north uh, a city called Palmdale. It's a quite well-known city if you know anything about airplanes. Uh, a lot of different airplane companies are located there, in particular Lockheed Skunk Works. And uh, there is also an airfield. Um, um, it's the Air Force Plant 42. You can see here at the northeast of Palmdale, zooming in further, you can see the airfield. And um, at the bottom, there's a bunch of buildings zoomed in right here which is the Dryden Aircraft Operations Facility. Dryden is uh, the NASA Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, a few miles, well, a few dozen miles northeast. And of course, it has been renamed to Armstrong Flight Research Center. So this should be corrected here in the Google Maps. But the point is, some of the flight operations have been outsourced, if you will, to Palmdale. And um, uh, Sophia is one of those. So what is SOFIA? Um, SOFIA is a converted 747 SP and the conversion is that at the back, at the last, uh, you know, rear of the airplane, there is a big door which contains a telescope, a 2.7 meter infrared telescope um, that is used for astronomy. The reason why it is mounted into an airplane is because infrared astronomy requires very dry air. Um, humidity is bad and by going up to the stratosphere 40,000 feet um, the telescope in the airplane is above most of the uh, humidity in the atmosphere and therefore the observations uh, well the, the seeing the quality the possible quality of observations is much higher and therefore it makes sense to do these kinds of observations from an airplane here's another uh, picture of the telescope the telescope is 2.7 meters that's quite significant and here you can see the, the door that has been added to the airplane. These are not pictures we took because obviously that has been during the uh, development phase. Here you can see the telescope itself. Um, and this is an overview over the fuselage. Um, you can see that the telescope is at the back. Further behind there's a bunch of infrastructure for the telescope itself. And then in the rest of the fuselage you can see all kinds of consoles for uh, various uh, crew members. I'll talk about that in a lot of detail. There is a few first class seats at the very front and of course there's the flight crew at the upper deck in the cockpit. 
this is an overview over the telescope itself. The telescope is in a section of the fuselage, fuselage that's not pressurized, while the instrument, the science instrument shown in red here, is in the pressurized part, and therefore the green thing is a bulkhead. Bulkheads are used in aircraft to separate pressurized from non-pressurized parts, and here they have added a special bulkhead that separates the telescope from the kind of crew part and the instrument. And you can also see there is a lot of um, sophisticated stuff going on that isolates, well, that, that first of all um, puts the telescope into the bulkhead. Obviously, the telescope has to be able to swivel up and down in elevation for observation purposes. And also, there is various damping elements, the vibration isolation system that isolates the telescope that isolates the telescope from the vibrations of the airplane. And um, there's a lot of engineering going into this one. I'll talk about that later. Here's the light path. The light comes in and is reflected by the primary mirror onto the secondary mirror, which then reflects it back down again into these. Let me go back. You can see here uh, in the middle this kind of little tower. This is the secondary mirror. This is the tertiary mirror. And this big one is the... Um, primary mirror and you can see that the tertiary mirror there are two of them the first one reflects only the infrared light which goes into the science instrument and um, the second one reflects the optical or visible light into the focal plane imager which is uh, an optical camera that uh, essentially takes a picture of what the telescope sees in infrared well no <laughs> it doesn't take a picture of the infrared it takes a picture of the optical light that comes from the same area at which the telescope looks in order to collect infrared light because the infrared part is the kind of the, the reason for the existence of the telescope. This is a, a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum and the point is a spectrum is essentially a um, well you what you do is on the x-axis of your diagram you have the wavelength and on the y-axis you have the energy received at that wavelength for a given place or location in the sky for any given source. And um, different gases have different absorption lines um, and essentially they create a fingerprint of certain chemical elements or reactions or physical processes and by observing these spectra um, Physicists can tell, t tell a lot about what's going on in the universe, and this is the purpose of uh, uh, spectroscopy. And one use for SOFIA is spectroscopy. And the instrument we flew with during our stay there was FIFI-LS, which is an imaging spectrometer. Um, I'll talk about that later. And SOFIA can work with different instruments, but this is the kind of instrument that has been used, and the result was essentially spectra like this, where... Again, it's the same thing as here, right? You can see peaks of energy or of received uh, energy at different radiations or wavelengths, and that's what it was all about. Here is how a spectrometer works. Essentially, you take the light source and then you reflect it onto a grating. A grating is, uh, in German, it's gitter, right? And so the grating um, essentially splits up the light in, into its constituent parts, and then these constituent parts are again reflected onto a detector, typically on a detector array with one, um, you know, essentially detection pixel per wavelength. And um, by doing this, you can essentially uh, detect what energy, how much light comes in at any given wavelength. This is the FIFLS spectrometer. It's a little bit more complicated. It's also quite a massive instrument. It has to be cooled to 4 Kelvin. And, um, you know, it needs to be certified or built to uh, sustain 9 Gs uh, to be kind of uh, able to be used in aircraft. There's not going to be 9, 9 Gs during the operation, but in case of a crash, there may be. That's the standard against which it needs to be certificated. And, um, well, it's a sophisticated instrument. I'll, I'll show a bit more about this later. So, plans and tracks. Um, here you can see that, uh, that what happened during a typical flight day. As you can see, we took off at 18.42 in the evening and the preparations start at uh, 7 in the morning, right? And you can see that all through the day, there's all kinds of things going on. 
Um, there is cryogen, cryogenic, or well, the, the cryogens, the cooling material is filled into the instrument. Um, the aircraft is towed outside, out of the hangar. It's fueled. Uh, there is a crew pre group crew briefing at 4:10, and um, and then there's you know weight and balance um, stuff like that. And there is then the mission briefing in this case at 4:40, and that's where we, the non-flight crew, joined. And I'll talk about that in a moment. This is the planned track. We took off from Palmdale, as you could see from the maps earlier. And we flew this kind of weird track. It is weird because, of course, at the end of the flight, we want to be back in Palmdale. And during the flight, we have to fly certain headings. Now, point is that the telescope cannot be moved, you know, back and forth. It can only point 90 degrees to the left of the airplane. It can point up and down. It can be moved up and down. But the direction it points in terms of cross elevation is always in... Um, well, 90 degrees, well, to the left of the airplane. And so if, depending on where you want to look at, the airplane has to fly a certain course, meaning a, a kind of geometric or geo, uh, non-magnetic true heading. And um, because stars move on the sky because of the Earth rotation, um, the stars move on the sky and therefore the aircraft has to turn all the time and that's why it flies these kind of curves. You can see different legs, so different things were observed. And um, yeah, so this was the planned track. Here is the uh, actual recording, or the I think it's flight aware. Um, yes, it says in the middle, flight aware. And um, you can see the actual track that has been flown, and you can see the altitude profile as well. Um, so you can see we started observing in roughly um, 37,000 feet, and then uh, we climbed up to 43,000 feet at the end as the aircraft became lighter because fuel was burned. It was able to climb higher with a given engine performance. Here's the second day's flight. It's kind of almost the mirror image, right? It's kind of to the inside of the US as opposed to over the ocean. But um, it's again these weird shapes. Here you can see the delta, right? There is the, the actual flight that has been flown was a little bit different than the planned flight. And that was because of uh, changes in the uh, observations, but also because if the winds are not as expected, then the winds blow the aircraft off course, well, I should say off track, because um, the heading has to be maintained. And then if you have wind from the side and you do not put your nose into the wind, then um, the airplane is blown away. And uh, therefore, the course, the actual flown track may be different than the one that had been planned. Again, they climbed to uh, 41,000 feet, as it looks here. I forgot what it actually was. So the rest of the presentation are a bunch of uh, photos, so you can get an impression of what was going on. So here is uh, NASA's big building. Can't quite tell what it said here before. It was something else before NASA took it over. It's building 703. Uh, you can't quite tell the size, but if you look at this picture that has been taken from the inside out, um, you can see it's a huge building. It's one of the bigger buildings. Um, this was the first contact with Sophia. That's what we kind of saw when we entered the hangar on Monday morning. I think Monday morning, yes. It's another picture. There's going to be a lot of pictures of the airplane because I think it's a beautiful airplane. Um, this truck here is used uh, not to deliver food as it would be on most uh, airliners. It's used to, uh, as essentially as a lift to uh, be able to deliver uh, new instruments or other instruments into the airplane and remove the currently uh, installed instrument. This picture is interesting. It shows uh, the box for the primary mirror cover. Um, it says Kaiser Trede. Kaiser Trede is a German um, space company and together with MAN, MA, MAN Technology and MAN GHH, never heard about GHH, uh, they have developed the telescope. It's now all part of OHB. Um, together with EADS, uh, it's the two remaining space companies essentially in Germany. They're not, they're different, right? OHB is not part of uh, EADS or Airbus Space, I guess, whatever it's called today. So another picture of Sophia. There's going to be many of those. Um, yet more workbenches all around the airplane for various technicians to do stuff. This is a bunch of containers. 
that have been placed there by the DSI people. DSI is the German Sophia Institute, and this is their own little workshop where they can do uh, machining and other things when they work on the telescope. So they have a little bit more space than in the NASA hangar. That's a nice picture, I think. Not going to comment all of these pictures. Just take a look and appreciate the airplane. You can also see that it's all very clean. Seems like the crew uh, puts a lot of pride into keeping this not very new. I think the airplane is from the 70s, 30 years old at least. Um, well, I'm actually not quite sure. But it's not a new airplane. I mean, the 747SP is kind of the generation of the Dash 200, I think. And so that is a child of the 80s, 70s, 80s. Picture after Sophia has been towed out during the night. Yeah, so we started our visit there with a tour of the instrument labs. The instrument labs are used to well work on the instruments. This one is a simulator that is used to test whether instruments can be attached to this kind of Naismith tube, which is what the telescope uh, kind of in, in the real airplane. Here you have the telescope, there you have the instrument. Uh, and here we use this kind of uh, equipment to simulate uh, various uh, radiation, um, you know, and to test certain aspects of the instrument. This is Sahir Ali, who is the head of the uh, instrument lab, who explained to us a bunch of details. This is great, the German receiver for astronomy at the terahertz, fr at terahertz frequencies. Great name. <laughs> um, and this is forecast, another um, instrument that can be attached to Sophia, you'll see FIFLS in a moment. They also have this mirror coding facility where they can take Sophia's main mirror and recode it. It's a huge vacuum chamber. And uh, this, this white thing you can see here is part of the lifting infrastructure of the, um, you know, of this, uh, 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 how do you call this? The uh, thing on top of the chamber that can be lifted and then this is the mirror cell, uh, mirror dummy, where they use this thing to train handling the mirror um, when trying to put it into the huge vacuum chamber here for recoding. So far it has not been recoded since it had been initially manufactured because it um, seems the uh, quality of the mirror is good enough so that that's not necessary. So NASA emphasizes safety a lot. Um, you don't necessarily always uh, sit on a seat which has one of these, you know, you know, all know this from the airline or safety briefing, you know, masks will fall from the ceiling uh, for emergency oxygen. Um, you may not be on one of these seats and therefore you have to carry around this little bag here that provides emergency passenger oxygen, the EPOS, and um, that is something we were kind of introduced into or introduced to. Um, here you can see the mask to which, well, that is the EPOS in its kind of non-packaged state. There is this uh, oxygen source and the mask and you put it over your head and you have about 20 minutes of oxygen, which is enough for the, for the airplane to descend from 40 something thousand feet down to whatever, 20,000 feet or 15,000 feet where you can breathe. Well, probably more like 10,000 feet where you can breathe without oxygen. We also got an introduction into the emergency radios, and of course the usual stuff about emergency exits and how to deal with a life vest and stuff like that. So then let's move on to the mission briefing. Mission briefing is where the whole mission crew um, meets before the flight. The mission crew is anywhere between 10 and 30 people, and um, they, as I said, they meet here and then they discuss all aspects of the flight. Um, this is the uh, mission director, Charlie Kaminsky in this case, and we started with um, the track. Uh, well, this is the second day, this is the fir first day. Um, the lady talking in the front is the meteor meteorologist who uh, talked about the weather. Obviously cloud cover is interesting, even though at 43,000 feet we are essentially above all the clouds. There may be some serious stuff above infrared. And of course then the uh, water vapor content in the atmosphere, which obviously is important for the quality of the observation. Next one is the science communications plan. Sophia has an intercom system where you can plug in your own headset 
and this is the you know definition of the channels you know the, whatever the SI science instrument team is on channel 3 you know the uh, EPO console is on channel 5 that would be the teachers stuff like that and then of course there is a discussion of all the science objectives for the flight um, all the legs are discussed and you know some detail is provided by the scientists or by the instrument operators who are kind of the proxies for the scientists during the flight if the scientists aren't flying themselves which they can some did uh, others didn't on our flights um, and then there is uh, an aircraft status whether there were any problems with the aircraft what you do in briefings typically all right so now uh, for a couple of shots from the flight line we uh, this was before well that was on monday when we just went to the airplane to take a bunch of photos very nice clouds by the way as well um, and this was before flight number one as you saw before it took off at 6 42 in the evening and so we boarded at around 5 taxi was I think at 18 20 uh, engine startup was at 18 o'clock uh, 6 p.m. and so we boarded about one hour before engine startup and this was when we walked the airplane and there is a bunch of more photos this was during uh, before boarding at the second flight it took off at 9 30 around 9 30 and in the evening and therefore it was dark well this may have been after landing of the first flight because they already attached the tow truck not not actually quite sure probably yeah well it is because it, the aircraft would have to be turned around to be able to taxi away this was after landing of the first flight and you can see two um Planets here, Venus and Jupiter, at the top above the rudder. And this was after landing in the morning on the second day. We landed on the second day at 7.30 or something, 7.15. And on the first day we landed at 4.40 in the morning, 4.50. The flight is almost always about 10 hours, and so the later you take off, the later you land. And uh, there were special precautions on that second flight because um, if you land while the sun is up, then you have to be sure that you have uh, plans for how to not expose the telescope to the sun in case the door doesn't close. And another picture of the tail. That's just some beautiful pictures. Ground crew. And because you only you haven't seen a lot of pictures yet, there are a bunch of more aircraft appreciation pictures. <laughs> somebody somebody deleted the smiley here. I had a smiley here. So there's the wingtips and slats. There is uh, the flaps, slats, and the engine. Here is the wing leading edge, polished as I've mentioned before. Everything is very clean. These are the engines. These are really um, kind of noisy, classical, low bypass JD90 turbojets. Um, these are not the original engines, but it's the original type. So it had it, the Sophia has not been re-engined with whatever CFM 56 or GE 90 engines. So it's kind of relatively old engines. They make a lot of kind of beautiful noise <laughs> during takeoff, especially if you're outside the engine. It's now the engine close up. More of those. You can see the reflection of me taking the photograph right here. <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice picture of the door. In fact, this is not the door. This is the kind of ramp where the door kind of moves over from the other side. The door is on the left side. So a bunch of pictures of the main gear, more main gear, even more main gear. Now that's, I guess, the wrong caption here. That's not the engine. That is still the gear. Nose gear, more nose gear, more nose gear. All right, so that's enough for the airplane. Let's move on to the telescope. This is the telescope from the inside. Um, in fact, this is the, the blue thing is the telescope counterweight. The telescope, of course, is on the other side of this bulkhead, as we explained earlier. And this is FIFLS here, the instrument. And these are counterweights that specifically counter the weight of that instrument. And another close-up. I'll talk about that guy later. These are some of the consoles. These are, in fact, the mission director and flight planner consoles. Um, 
This is the teles instrument team, telescope team, scientists. This is the cryo pumps for the instrument cooling. All palletized so it can be removed because different instruments need different cooling or may not need any cooling, I don't know. This is the power electronics for the telescope itself, I think. Here you can see some of the you know, cabling and the vibration isolation system. Listen to the podcast and Oliver Zeile explains in a lot of detail how this works. Here you can see the kind of inner workings of some of the aircraft of the airplane. There's a bunch of floor plates have been removed. And you can see a lot of cables. I mean, it's a very sophisticated piece of kit, as I think the British say. Um, it's a quite sophisticated instrument. And I'm not going to explain to you all the details. This is really meant more as a way of giving you an impression. Listen to the podcast if you want to hear the details explained by the, by the, you know, by the actual experts, not by me here. Cables, no paneling, right? This is directly the exposed uh, wrapped skin of the airplane as Boeing built it, I guess, back in the day. So this is uh, before takeoff. Uh, this is a picture taken from the nose, photographed to the tail. You can see the stairs going up to the upper deck. This is some of the mission control equipment. It's installed at the front as a counterweight um, of the heavy telescope. The telescope is about 20 tons, and so obviously the airplane needs to be in balance, and so there needs to be some weight in the front. There's also a couple of very heavy uh, lead or heavy metal uh, floor plates. This guy rebooted some part of the mission control system a bunch of times before takeoff. And this is now during the flight. This is the mission planner working on his console. Again, the flight director here, and the, uh, sorry, the mission director here, flight planner there, and then the instrument and telescope teams visible here. This is another, I think, quite nice picture. It's organized a little bit like NASA mission control, right? You have the mission director who manages the whole thing, and then you have specialists for, you know, telescope, science, and uh, instrument and they have their own communications channels but then the mission director listens into everything and can you know connect people and it's it's quite the same principle more pictures so if you look at it was also funny we obviously looked out the window quite a bit this was palmdale after takeoff this was san francisco at some point and this is an interesting picture because uh, you have to look closely it, it shows four planets right it's here venus jupiter Mars and Mercury down here and so when this was visible half the airplane uh, ran to the windows because you know these are all astronomers or many of them and they all took pictures and, oh let's look you know look cool very funny here are some of the consoles mission director console which provides access to the plant and the actual flight path and real and you know tools to help with real-time adjustment um, this is the EPO console for educational public outreach I'll show some actual screenshots of the contents of the console later. This is the science instrument people at work. And the telescope operation people. More telescope operation people. More instrument people. And uh, yeah, this is, by the way, the communications panel that uh, lets you configure which uh, intercom channels you want to take part in with your headset. You can select, you know, decide whether you want to listen or you want to talk. Listen is green, red is talk. Typically you talk on one and you listen on several. So some screenshots of the console. That's the EPO console that gives you a bit of um, insight into what the telescope and the instrument does. You know, for example, here it shows the status of the door, the rewind status of the telescope. Listen to the podcast if you don't know what these terms mean. Um, this is essentially the airplane itself, you know, where is it, what's the course flying, what altitude, all kinds of different parameters. This is the um, imagers used for um, pointing the telescope. The telescope is pointed by optically looking at uh, certain targets, like for example those, and then um, that's used for stabilization, and then the uh, actual infrared data is taken from the center of the telescope. Here is a nice picture where one of the teachers brought their own laptop to run some kind of astronomy sky view kind of program to orient themselves, you know, where are we actually looking? Um, there's more tracking targets. And this is a 
spectrum of preliminary data on a scientist's laptop. This is the uh, mission director console with a flight track. And here's a bunch of screenshots from the science instrument control and the telescope control. It's, it's a whole lot of Unix and Java programs with a whole lot of logs and status displays, you know, a bunch of DOS boxes running in this case on Windows. Uh, it's very diverse software that runs these things. A bunch of pictures of scientists. Scientists can use two of these, like, you know, groups of four seats with tables. They can plug in their own laptops into the mission control system and then they get the data from that system to directly work with the data and do some preliminary data reduction to see if the data that is collected by the telescope makes any sense and then maybe adjust the observations in real time. More pictures of scientists. Here, uh, I guess, she was observing uh, uh, Randolph, Maria was observing Randolph because she, he may actually have been reducing her preliminary data. So she, was, she was actually interested, obviously. You can also see a bunch of cookies and sweets and stuff. Uh, there is always some of those. Uh, it was the task of the um, guests, teachers and me to bring some of those cookies. This was also interesting because one of the reduction pipeline people who actually works on the software that reduces the data, make it you know go from instrument to physics, um, <laughs> he tweaked the reduction code during the flight. So they didn't just take the data and reduce it, they actually you know, worked on the software that reduced the data during the flight to optimize reduction itself. And this was Alfred Krabbe, uh, professor of Astronomy University of Stuttgart, explaining to the teachers some of the basics of infrared astronom astronomy. And again, uh, Alfred, Robert and Ilka. This is Martin, this is Nick, one of the PA people, NASA, this is me. So, cockpit in flight, I got to fly during one of the takeoffs. It's actually an interesting experience because, as you can see, this is a, it has a glass cockpit, the uh, Sophia airplane, but it's still the original 747SP instruments, and that's because the, uh, the, the glass cockpit has been retrofitted, but it only is for avionics, the, the systems of the airplane are still the old analog ones. And so they also still have a flight engineer and this um, photo was taken during engine startup and so you can see parts of the startup procedure is run by the flight engineer and part is done by the pilot and the co-pilot on the, uh, well, doing stuff on the engine quadrant. Here is a photo of the flight engineer panel, mostly analog except for some of the engine instruments. And again, it's a nice contrast between the old uh, stuff and the new glass cockpit. What's also interesting is that um, they all use iPads all the time. They have their performance charts and their checklists on iPads. I also saw them using some kind of navigation software, you know, track the airplane along because it seems like um, at least for plotting the track, the software available on iPads is more convenient than the one in the glass cockpit. And this was uh, shortly before landing on 249 on the second flight because there we landed in the morning when the sun was up. That's actually a very nice picture, I think. I didn't take those. It was Oliver here because um, obviously I was only in the cockpit during takeoff on flight number two, not during landing. Some quirks. Who needs paneling, right? So, uh, you know, um, the there's some air taken from the air conditioning system that usually goes into the cabin, uh, but it's used for cooling some of the electronics. This again is essentially a you know just a, a you know used to detect gas flow. As long as there's gas flowing through the instrument, this thing is uh, inflated. If this deflates, then that acts as a warning that something is wrong with the cooling of the instrument. Very simple, but very pragmatic, useful. They did have, uh, you know, uh, one of these safety cards, uh, specifically for Sophia. I was surprised about that, because obviously there is only one instance of Sophia, but they still printed those cards. This is Fifi, uh, Fifi LS's mascot. In Germany, Fifi is, you know, typical kind of idiomatic dog name. Sophia is a cold airplane, because it's, instrument, it's better for the instrument, you know, it's better for cooling if it's rather cold and so because you always, you know, do what's good for the instrument, 
you cool down the airplane and so people have to bring hats and caps and stuff and in this case we have to somehow fit the hat with the headset this is a picture of Christian Fischer the uh, instrument engineer and as you can see he has like three coats and a cap and or a hat and then uh, you can't see it but he has warm shoes so it was really I wouldn't say freezing it was probably 15 centigrade but it was still rather cold especially once you get tired these are some two examples of innovative high-tech solutions. There's always, I think, uh, zip ties, cable ties, um, or and, and you know trash bags. Um, there was also a lot of, uh, well, not a lot of, but there was some duct tape in various places, as you would expect from aviation. This is the kitchen. There's always some coffee. There's a bunch of fridges and microwaves. And again, these were two pictures where uh, people. Um, you know, ran to the window and tried to take pictures, you know, make it dark, take the code, make it dark so I can take a picture because there was cool stars on the outside. More of those. So, um, NASA had a lot of interesting other aircraft here in Palmdale. Um, we were not allowed to photograph those, specifically not the ER-2, the, the civilian version of the U-2, the spy plane. Um, but there's a lot of aircraft pictures, similar pictures on the web. So I put a couple of pictures in here to give you an impression with the URL here. So it's not my picture, it's uh, taken from NASA's website. This is the ER2 that's used for high altitude uh, research. And you can see how they have uh, removed the nose and part of these uh, canisters on the wing. Uh, you can exchange instruments by exchanging noses. And so that's what they do here. This is when it's assembled. Beautiful airplane. It's a jet airplane, can go up to 70-something thousand feet. By the way, I also have a podcast episode on the U-2. Um, I guess I'm going to link to that as well from the slash Sophia page. And um, this is before takeoff, before landing. Really beautiful, beautiful airplane after landing. This car is used for chasing the airplane when it lands to talk the pilot down. To, essentially, the, the airplane has to be stalled onto the ground, so the airplane has to be stalled about half a meter above ground, above the runway, and this is kind of tricky. And so the kind of chase car has another pilot in the car, and they talk to the flying pilot how high this they are. So they kind of catch up with the airplane during landing, and then do they, they do that. Another really beautiful picture. And that's the picture of the chase car, and you can see the little vertical tails here, supposedly used for increasing directional stability, but I guess <laughs> it also just looks cool. There's a few banners. This is an embroidery that I found inside Sofia, the logos of the various um, institutions, Armstrong Flight Research Center and the briefing room. This one is really cool. We fly airplanes. By the way, I also have an episode with a test pilot that flies this F-18. I guess I should <laughs> link to that as well. And uh, on the consoles and in the hangar. All right, there's a few pictures of me at work. This is me, uh, you know, at work, meaning recording podcast. That's me before flight number 248. This is the magic cable that we used to plug in the recorder into um, Sophia's intercom system to record some of the intercom communications. It didn't work that well. The intercom recordings really aren't that great. So it's maybe about one hour of the 10 hours is intercom recordings and you have to be somewhat, you know, able to sustain pain. <laughs> but it's actually really interesting. We had, uh, uh, for example, the uh, thrust reverser on engine number three didn't stow after landing number one. There's a bunch of interesting discussions going on what to do about that. So it's worth listening, but it, you need a quiet environment and it's annoying. And this is my attempt to record uh, intercom without this cable. We didn't have that in the beginning, and so I just plugged one of my microphones into a headset speaker and put some duct tape around it. And that's me at work interviewing flight track planner Ken Bauer. All right. So we should say this sentence. Um, it's kind of a you know the sentence that we should always talk about that Sophia is a project of the DLR and NASA, operated by the Deutsche Sophia Institute, University of Stuttgart and the USRA, and it's financed through the German Ministry for uh, Economic, Economics and Energy and the German state Baden-Württemberg and the University of Stuttgart, and of course NASA.
<laughs> and uh, obviously we want to thank DLR, DSI, USRA, NASA, and in particular Antidote and Nick and the mission teams of the two flights. We were participating for an exciting and inspiring week in Palm that it was really cool. I mean, for me, as a science and aviation geek, this was kind of the best of both worlds. This was really cool. Uh, it was one of the best weeks I've ever spent. So that's the end. Don't forget to go to the actual, you know, to the podcast website and download the podcast to learn something from the real experts and not just from me blabbering on. All right, that's it. Thanks.